Corridor villagers want safety and security in Hela. First three APEC vehicles sold. And Baramandi's secure gold playoff in Samoa. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for this evening's news. People in Karida village in the Taripori district of the Hela province have appealed for a permanent police and defence force presence in the local level government area to prevent further bloodshed. Karida is where 18 women and children were killed by warring tribesmen early Sunday morning in retaliation over seven murders in the neighbouring Munima village. The appeal comes after the Hela provincial government declared the area a fighting zone. We warn that some of the images will be disturbing for viewers. On Wednesday, some of the bodies of the 18 women and children were buried by the roadside in Karida number one village. They are the latest innocent victims of a 20-year tribal conflict driven by local warlords in the Tagali local level government area. <laughs> This lamb, Mary got bell. Outside, Nabla Mary got bell. Karida number one was not directly involved in the fighting that initially left seven people dead in neighboring Monima village, but they were, however, accused of harboring an in law involved in the attack, and the women and children paid the ultimate price. <laughs> This is one of several houses burned during the attack on Sunday morning. The villagers said the women were like the anchors in the community. Their lives firmly rooted in the village. They cared for the land and the animals while the men traveled in between Tari, Port Moresby and Mount Hagen. One of the women was burnt with the hut. Two other younger women were killed outside. One of them tried to rescue her older sister when she was cut down. And this is where the worst of the attacks happened. A whole family killed. Two women pregnant with their unborn children were killed outside their own home. It's been difficult to mourn for them with the people unable to settle into their normal lives. The only thing giving them some sense of security are the army and police patrols that have been going into the village since the raid happened on Sunday. Police and provincial authorities say the killing of women and children is unprecedented. Three months into office, the provincial police commander is facing his first major challenge. He says dialogue remains key in finding a solution and bringing the warring parties together. The Defence Force have gone ahead to withdraw uh, one of the platoons from Anga and they are on their way yet now as I speak. They would arrive today and I look to deploy any available men that I have with the defence team into Karita. On Wednesday, the Hela provincial government declared the Tagali local level government area a fighting zone. The police and defence force numbers are stretched with only 40 police personnel and one PNG defence force platoon. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Tari. Police Minister Brian Kramer today went to Karida village where he promised that action will be taken against the killers of the 18 women and children. He has also appealed to the people not to retaliate. A stern warning has been issued to the killers to turn themselves in or be tracked down and arrested. He said a long-term strategy will be given to cabinet to fix the problem. 
Two Maseratis and one Bentley purchased for use in APEC 2018 have been sold, according to Finance Minister Charles Abel. The announcement comes four weeks after former minister responsible for APEC, Justin Tichenko, blamed the Finance Department for not following due process in tendering the luxurious vehicles. The Finance Department is now looking at a set minimum price of 400,000 kina for each Maserati and 800,000 kina for each Bentley. Minister Charles Abel made these remarks when ending over the keys of 22 ambulances and 13 fire trucks that were donated to the PNG government to use during the 2018 APEC Leaders Summit. Some of the fire trucks will be given to fire stations in other provinces. The same will be done for the ambulances. When it comes, comes back to the Maseratis and the Bentleys, the cabinet after we informed Cabinet that there was an initial auction exercise that happened um, in, uh, through which uh, two Maseratis were sold and one Bentley uh, and some of the options around what to do, Cabinet has instructed we go back and uh, reconduct that auction exercise uh, locally and internationally to um, give every opportunity <coughs> that those assets can be disposed of and value returned to the state. In the absence of um, that successful disposal exercise because it's not a fire sale. Uh, we want to get uh, at least uh, a reserve price, which in the case of the um, Maserati is 400,000 kina minimum, and in the case of the Bentley is 800,000 kina minimum. But the focus of many Papua New Guineans has always been on the 40 Maseratis and three Bentleys purchased by the national government under the leadership of then Prime Minister Peter O'Neill. Soon after the APEC Leaders Summit ended in November last year, the former minister responsible for APEC, Justin Chechenko, said the Maseratis were selling like hotcakes. But by June 2010 this year, Minister Chechenko said, because due processes were not followed, interested buyers had not come forward to purchase the cars. He also said he was frustrated that the delay by the finance department in tendering cars had led to the delay in completing the APEC report. We had a huge expressions of interest in the beginning. And then because of this long drawn out pro process, I mean, people have lost interest. So it's uh, unfortunate, but we have to go back to the drawing board and uh, re-tender due to the fact that um, they have to get it done properly. It has been eight long months since the Finance Department took on the responsibility of disposing of all APEC vehicles and assets. And Finance Secretary Dr. Ken Nangan says while 45 of the APEC vehicles are still unaccounted for, they will be able to track down the individuals holding onto the cars so all cars can be disposed of according to law. Total of vehicles that uh, were in the position of APEC, of 502. So we have most of it, that's about 45, uh, not yet accounted for, but we'll start doing that. What we'll, doing, what we'll be doing that some of those assets, vehicles are now kept with by uh, state departments, ministries. In the disposal process, uh, we will be asking all assets to be returned. Meanwhile, heads of the PNG Fire Service and St. John Ambulance in Port Mosby have welcomed the government's decision to donate the ambulance and fire trucks. We are blessed with uh, more than 13 uh, fire trucks and uh, the fire trucks uh, have posted uh, the activities of our firemen around the uh, NCD and particularly in other provinces where we will be donating uh, those fire trucks. We attend to emergency cases every day. For the last three months, we've attended for almost 3,000 cases for the three months. And this morning or today, with this donation of the ambulances, it will be used in serving our people of NCD and Central Province as well. The buses and other vehicles that were donated to the PNG government for APEC will be disposed of in the coming weeks. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News.
PNG Ports Corporation Limited has donated 100,000 kina to help the West New Britain Provincial Government to reopen schools, aid posts and health centres in the volcano disaster area. PNG Ports Management made this decision to reach out to the volcano disaster victims in West New Britain following the recent Mount Ulawun volcano eruption. Newly appointed Governor Francis Maneke says the donation will help affected communities rebuild. The Mount Ulawun volcano in West New Britain erupted at 6 a.m. on the morning of Wednesday, June 26. The eruption ceased after 24 hours, but in that time it forced the, the displacement of over 10,000 people. The East New Britain Development Corporation, or ENBDC, the business arm of the East New Britain Provincial Government, has made a noticeable loss in revenue over the years. During its annual general meeting in Kokopo yesterday, the newly appointed board chairman, Isaac Minikas, said much of the loss have been spurred by a change in business activities and a non-compliance by the previous management. The East New Britain Development Corporation has been put under the spotlight in recent years following allegations of maladministration by the previous board that almost brought the multi-million Kina company to its knees. But for now, it's a new beginning for the company. The new board and group CEO, Isaac Minico, says at its annual general meeting in Kokopo yesterday, a report on the progress of the provincial government's business arm was tabled and a copy of its financial performance was presented to the East New Britain governor. The value of the company is 128.7 million in 2018. In 2017, it was 135.5 million. Now, these are the official audited uh, results of the company. The report presented by Mr. Minikus yesterday indicated that the company has made an accumulated loss of more than 1 million kina in revenue since 2014. The CEO explained much of the shortfalls between 2014 and 2018 were prompted by what he described as adapting to a competitive market and secondly, non-compliance incurred from the previous management. My new board of directors is strategically aligning ENBDC Group uh, business operations to support its <coughs> own shareholders' uh, provincial development agenda. If I own a company, yeah, and I don't have dividend until every day, it's here where well, something is wrong. And this is what has happened for the last how many years, sir? Uh. Since taking office, East New Britain Governor Naki Kuskonga has called for a reshuffle to the company's executive management. The governor's call follows instances of no proper management of company records and also the previous constitution used by the management to run the company was not legit. After numerous court battles between the executives, a new board was appointed and headed by Mr. Minikus. I have made some very tough decisions uh, and bold ones as well, which have raised many eyebrows, but these were necessary. Uh, and long overdue changes needed for business improvement and increased profitability. The East New Britain Development Corporation comprises mainly stevedoring, supermarkets and huge portions of cocoa and coconut plantations. The new head of the company says they are tapping into niche markets and salvaging previous businesses and reviving them to regain what has been lost. One such business is the abundant Sinivit gold mine in the Pomio district and it says the new board has been issued with a new term of reference and that is to go through all the company's past records, evaluate them and provide constant reports on its financial performances to its shareholders. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. You're at Friday's news. Among stories after the break, Telecom supports 2019 Mask Festival in Kokopo, plantation workers stranded in city after eviction, and rural Anglimp South in Jiwaka to benefit from 8 million Kina Bridge. That and more when we come back. Welcome back. Over 100 plantation workers and their families from the Doha rubber plantation in Central Province have been left stranded in the city after they were evicted. They were evicted by the Chinese company that manages the plantation. The workers said one family has lost their mother and wife whilst being stranded here in the nation's capital. 
This is where the evicted families have been living for the last four months. They were living under this rain tree at the Unagi Oval in the nation's capital when a family lost their mother. They said they were forcefully evicted from the plantation by the Chinese company who runs it. Where company come in, or agreement belong company signing one time people, I mean, no, I mean, no, so we people one black agreement form. Now, me play come, son of Lolo complain, where me play stop on this like a number 181 people, where me play settle here, one and take up in this 180, and me play son of Viet complain long living condition, blue blah, where living condition, you know, good blood to Maslow, like blue blah. All plantation workers were brought in from other provinces and have been working at the plantation for a very long time. One worker, Morin Kago, said they now have no place to go because Doha Rabba Plantation has been their only home for many years. Life is hard, must be life. Na mi plastili plo here, must em em planty or street monkey too, or stuff come disturb me mi plo, or stuff make you some plo time mi plo sleep, some plo time mi plo no sleep, mi plo stuff sit down mi koko. Matthew Ammonia is a plantation worker who has spent all his life working at the plantation. According to Ammonia, the plantation workers were overworked but paid only 150 kina a fortnight. In March this year, they staged a sit-in protest to petition the company to increase their salary and pay their royalties accordingly. However, as a result of the protest, they were served with an eviction notice by the company. And whilst being stranded in the city, Matthew Ammonia also also lost his wife, the mother to his children. Me citizen of Papua New Guinea. Company should treat me the way in Papua New Guinea where we can stand up strong and make him work plan. So as for now, I come straight treating me or same. Underpay me or treating me or same. Me play in one belt. Long this last, me play uh, strong on pay rise. Now this last something stuff in the company victim me play. After living on the streets for over four months, the families are now living with the member for Maprik, John Simon, at his Taurama residence. Minister Blona Agriculture and Livestock, uh, uh, John Simon, uh, MP Blona uh, Maprik, uh, open. I am a Timmy Plan and I am a Stab Blon Hand Plan. People of me like story or something, me talk thank you, and me talk thank you, and me appreciate him. This uh, Minister Blona Agriculture and Livestock. They are now calling on the government and the public to help them take this matter to the court. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Telecom PNG Limited has supported the 2019 National Mask and Warwagira Festival in Kokopo with a sponsorship of 5,000 kina. Festival Chairman Isaac Ilo thanked Telecom PNG for their timely support. This is Telecom PNG's first time to participate in the festival and it has joined other business houses as the bronze sponsor. The sponsorship has also strengthened the existing relationship Telecom has with the Kokopo business community with the hope of sponsoring the events in the coming years. The World Population Day was celebrated in Port Moresby with the theme 25 years of the International Conference on Population and Development, accelerating the promise. Every year on July 11th, World Population Day is celebrated, aiming to shift global focus toward the urgency and significance of issues related to population. The celebration also marks the anniversary of the program of action adopted at the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo in 1994 to which PNG is a signatory. It also marks the 50th anniversary of the United Nations Population Fund. Papua New Guinea is one of the 179 countries that adopted the ICPD program of action in 1994, recognizing that reproductive health and rights, as well as women empowerment and gender equality are cornerstones of population and development programs. Of ICPD covers the areas of poverty, eradication and employment, covers the area of health, sexual reproduction, health services and rights, it also covers the area of education, gender equality and women's empowerment. In order for world population programs to progress, it is vital to advance gender equality, eliminate violence against women and ensure women are free to manage their fertility without fear or coercion. ICPD recognizes that people need to be empowered to make their own choices regarding these aspects of population. On the World Population Day today, I call on all of us 
from government, civil society, communities, and people from all sectors and walks of life to be bold and encourage us to do what is right for women and girls around the world. For Papua New Guinea, the country's population has been growing steadily with a high fertility rate. According to statistics from the National Statistics Office, about 50% of the country's population are young people aged less than 21. The theme of the world population is fitting for the time as the country's population growth is accelerating and exceeding the economic growth. PNG's population has increased dramatically over the last decade and the growth rate at 3.1% annually, with a high fatality rate of 4.2%. Patricia Kiamo, National MTV News. Local farmers in Moran, Gobe, Kutubu and Hides will participate in the fresh produce value chain and other sectors thanks to the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the three parties yesterday. Oil Search Limited, Fresh Produce Development Agency and PNG Mining and Petroleum Hospitality Services are joining hands to empower communities by increasing quality vegetable production and enabling direct access to the fresh produce market. The MOU will expand on oil search's existing sustainable agriculture programs and will add direct value from farm to plate within our project impact areas. FPDA believes this will ensure farmers become players in food production, supply and consumption. The MOU was signed by FPDA General Manager Mark Warrenu, all such as Leo Buskins and PNG Mining and Petroleum Hospitality Services, Peter Heno. The construction of a new bridge at Mugmump in the Anglimp South Wagi area of Juwaka province will connect these people with the outside world. They have been separated from the province since 1992 when their only bridge collapsed and washed away by the fast flowing Wagi River. Anglimp South Wagi MP Joe Cooley commissioned the new bridge yesterday. Vasinatayama with this report. When national election comes around and intending candidates visit voters during campaign, most would ask for money, favors or service in return for their votes. This has been a practice in PNG politics. For these people of Mukmamp, they requested their member of parliament for a new bridge to ease their movement to access better services. Communities have been traveling across the Wagi River using tire tubes for the last 27 years. Food rations, cargoes and even visitors travel to and fro using Wagi. A coffee factory there also transports its coffee bags across on tubes. It was the same story as locals crossed the river to witness the launching of the 8 million Kina Bridge. Many were left in tears as they witnessed machines and a fleet of vehicles. About 80% of people living there are from other provinces and settled during the colonial days to work at the tea, coffee and forestry plantations. This is an impact project that will not only benefit the people but will help revive coffee, tea and forestry. A million, million investment staff. Local MP Joe Cooley says he will focus in connecting the neglected missing links in his electorate during his term in office. Vastinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. This is Friday's News. We'll bring you more of today's stories when we come back. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the news. A total of 518,000 kina will be paid to the Oro Provincial Assembly and Provincial Executive Council before the return of rates of the local level government elections on July 27th. This announcement was made after Northern Governor Gary Jufa, in consultation with the Salaries and Remuneration Commission, instructed the acting provincial administrator to work with the SRC Secretariat at the National Parliament to have the final entitlement sorted. Governor Jufa says these men and women deserve to be paid out their final entitlements in full through their respective LLGs for their services to the people of Aura. Over 100 members of the Revival Church of the Northwest Sub-Centre in Port Moresby came out this morning with their pitchforks and rakes for a clean-a-thon at the Bagheta Police Barracks in Waigani. This initiative by the church dates back to 2015 when the church cleaned certain areas around the city as part of their community service. Members of the Revival Church of PNG conducted a clean-a-thon this morning at the Bagita Police Barracks in Waigani. Men, women and children came armed with pitchforks, rakes and bush knives and cleaned the area around their fellowship centre and the police residence. The huge pile of rubbish sitting in front of the barracks was dug out and cleaned. Revival District Pastor Michael Kuman says since their fellowship centre is within the vicinity of the police barracks, they do clean atones once or twice in a month as a way of giving back to the community. The police department is a very important facility for the fellowship. In return, this arrangement is where over the time, maybe once in a month or maybe twice, we have come to clean all the rubbish and clean all the rubbish in the area. When asked if they get help from any organizations, Pastor Michael says they do not wait for assistance from organizations or the government, but do this initiative from their heart. All the tools and garbage bags they use to clean and pack rubbish are either the chats members or provided by the chats. Once the cleanathon is done and all the garbage is packed and piled, they liaise with the waste management of NCDC to provide transport to dispose of it. Yes, basically, we uh, collect all the rubbish bins, we ask them all NCDC, so now you look in big truck, we come along, uh, dispose this load of the rubbish, we will go to the barony. Waste management in the city is a responsibility of NCDC, but it has been neglected for some time. A senior environmental health officer from the NCDC Waste Management Division is urging church groups and sports groups as well as city residents to follow initiatives like this. Yeah, we are trying to create a, a, a waste conscious society yeah, and part of the waste conscious society is uh, the, the community, community residents must take ownership and, and which is part of the churches now that we are taking up. So the church well centers of poverty have uh, taken this initiative to come in to assist the uh, uh, the NCDC uh, in uh, partnering in clearing our uh, city of waste and, uh, because uh, waste obviously have, has an impact on the environment plus our children as well. Uh. Patricia Chiamo, National MTV News. 58 female candidates have already nominated for this year's LLG elections in the Morabe province. According to the election manager for the province, Simon Soheke, more than 2,000 candidates have nominated. The election manager said the figure only covers six districts from the nine districts in Morabe. Three LLGs in Tewai CRC district are yet to submit their reports. The election manager for Morbe province, Simon Soheke, told MTV News yesterday the 2,584 candidates have nominated for the LLG election in the province. 58 are female candidates and 2,525 are male. The candidates began their campaign this week and will continue through to next week. Polling is expected to start on the 20th of this month. So far, so good. Uh, we have had a peaceful uh, nomination period. We are anticipating a peaceful uh, campaign period and polling and counting period as well. Depends on uh, each candidate and everybody, stakeholders involved in these elections. There are 567 wards in 33 local level governments in the nine districts of Morbe province. The election manager said logistics still remains a problem in the province. 
So Hackers said the office is yet to receive reports of nominations from three areas in the province. I'm receiving reports from the AROs now, from various LLGs districts. Uh, so far, I've received most of the uh, updates. Uh, I still have to get three more. Uh, problem is with uh, logistics traveling in back from the various uh, districts or LLGs where they are stationed. In Lake District, 256 candidates nominated on the 4th of July this year, 143 candidates for IELLG and 113 from Lake Abern that include five women candidates. By the end of the month, we should know the various councillors in each uh, LLG. And after that, after the return of which, uh, we are given the law says that we are given 15 days after the return of bridge to uh, set up the various uh, LLG meetings for uh, for uh, uh, election of the presidents. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. A total of 2,021 candidates are contesting the local level government elections in Medang province. 23 of them are women who will be up against more than 1,000 men candidates who are vying for respective seats in the third tier of government. Medang district alone has nine women candidates, making it the district with the highest number of female candidates who have registered to run. Husino Bundi district registered eight women, Sumkar five, and Rai Coast where only one woman candidate will contest. There are no women candidates contesting in the Bogia and Middle Ramu districts. All nominations have been confirmed and this information has already been sent to the PNG Electoral Commission headquarters in Port Moresby. Turning overseas now, there is a new divide between rich and poor in Miami, Florida. As CNN reports, it's all about the climate change crisis and another issue called climate gentrification. This intersection is nine feet above sea level. This one is seven, that one is six. And these numbers are just one reminder that in the age of sea level rise, elevation is everything. The plan is to raise no, the seawall to here. It'll be about this high. In ritzy Miami Beach, they're raising streets, changing building codes. The water is rising and it won't recede. In well-to-do Pinecrest, they formed America's first underwater homeowners association. But in working-class immigrant neighborhoods like Little Haiti, year-to-year -year sea level rise gets lost in the day-to-day -day struggle. They had no idea they were living a lofty three feet higher than their rich neighbors, but they figured it out when strangers started calling and buying. They are being pushed out from, uh, from their homes, from their businesses. We are now... Because uh, high ground is, because, is because, valued property Well, now. believe it or not, we didn't know that. Investors from as far away as China began buying land, raising rent. Mom and pop businesses began to disappear. And after the kids in Marlene's community center had to move three times, she learned the term climate gentrification. Do you imagine a day where property values could almost flip, where what used to be the bad side of the railroad tracks is more valuable because it's high ground as opposed to the beach. I don't imagine it for climatic reasons. I imagine it for other uh, gentrification reasons. Miami's Republican mayor championed a plan to spend $400 million on the climate crisis, including funds to keep low-income folks from being priced out of safe neighborhoods. But Marlene says she'll believe it when she sees it and fought hard to stop a billion-dollar development called Magic City in... You guessed it, Little Haiti. They want to build 25 stories. That will be the end of the Little Haiti. Right. That will be the end but of But doesn't the it also mean thousands of new jobs for the community? For who? For not who? for you, not for these for folks. For they won't be here to access the jobs uh. because they will be displaced. What but her protest of failed. Of and after Magic City promised 31 million to the community, the mega project was approved. The area we took was all industrial. There was no real thriving economy around these warehouses or vacant land. So our goal is to create that economy. Is sea level rise part of the equation? Well, look, we're in the time that we purchased this property, obviously climate change is something that everybody looks at. But it wasn't a factor 
that we considered when acquiring the property. The reality is that it's inevitable. Leone is among the Haitian leaders who believes gentrification is out of control. So they might as well embrace Magic City and hope for the best. You say we need to be part of the solution yeah. because if you're not around the table, what are you? The meal. We don't want to be nobody's meal. <laughs> this puts her at odds with Marlene. But they are just a sample of how a slow motion disaster is dividing neighbors. How climate is giving new meaning to the old saying, real estate is all about location, location, and elevation. Chukai Sports is next. Don't go away. We'll bring you rugby, cricket, and basketball highlights from the 16 Pacific Games in Apia, Samoa. Stay tuned for details. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The team PNG Barramundis will be in the gold medal playoff tomorrow following their matches against New Caledonia and Vanuatu today. Skipper Asad Vala says there is no space for complacency as they work towards regaining the gold medal which they lost in 2015. PNG came away from this morning's match against New Caledonia with a comfortable win. New Caledonia opted to bat first and eventually set a target of 58 for the Barras, and it came down to the Barras bowling lineup that ended their opponent's gold medal campaign early on. Uh, we've been doing really well uh, the first the first five days, I think, since Monday, we have won all our games, um, five from five. Very proud of the way we have been playing. Uh, some, uh, the standards we have set ourselves, you know, we brought the uh, best team across to try and regain our gold medal we lost in the home Pacific game. So it's, it's been really good the way we've been playing and the standards we have set. The batters are doing really good, really good job, but I think. The games have been set up really well by the bowlers. I think we have bowled uh, ball first in all the five games we have played, and we have bowled all the tips out under 100, and we have passed the score, so it's looking good for us. Nicola Donna was all out at 57, and PNG Cruz passed the target with all wickets intact in the second inning. Tomorrow's grand final playoff will see PNG Bars vie for the gold medal, and they are not getting ahead of themselves because they're expecting some challenge. They are all strong opponents. In this format, T20, anything can happen. If someone can score a quick fire 70 or 80, then someone can have a good spell in getting some early wickets, can put a team under pressure. You know. So we don't, we don't want to be complacent, but we just want to keep going, uh, doing what we've been doing well over the last five days. Hopefully we can continue the next two games. Merci. For these specific games, the core of the team is here with the inclusion of two new faces to the PNG side, and both have also done well. And that is something the team looks to maintain tomorrow. I uh, keep um, sending you support, and uh, Team PNG really needs it, and hopefully we can do you guys proud. Strico, National MTV Sports, up here somewhere. Still on the same match, PNG New Caledonia match, new edition. Hirihiri scored 39 runs to acquire the man of the match. This is what he had to say. Uh, it's been one year since I left the boys, and it's good to be back with the boys and playing alone. With them, it's very grateful for me, and I'm, I'm happy to this man of the match again. Uh, I just want to say hello to my friends and my family and all the people back in Papua New Guinea. And now we cross live to MTV's Dini Rose Raiko, who is at the International Broadcast Center in Apia, Samoa. Here's Dini Rose with members of the VAA team. Thank you, Helen. I'm here with the VAA guys. I have here um, Gabe Ray, he's the coach for the VAA team, and I have Ura Gimana, who is, an, who is a VAA athlete. Now, um, 
the coach will be telling us a little bit about um, the performance in the last few days and what's coming up um, in the coming days. Uh, coach, thank you very much for your time. Um, I know the girls got a bronze and a silver. Tell us a little bit about the performance in the last few days. Uh, it's been a really uh, tough uh, in the last few days, but uh, but our girls managed to come up with a really, uh, come up with a really strong team. And uh, but really unfortunately, we came up with a silver on the V12. Uh, and then we come up with a V6, uh, 1500, the girls won uh, bronze. So, so far the girls have done a, quite, uh, really done a great job and compared to the, the times that from our last 2015 Pacific Games in PNG, the girls have, the times have improved uh, much and by about 20, 26 seconds the difference so the girls have broken the national record, which is um, really, really uh, impressed with the you know, performance. That's great news. What's coming up next? I know there'll be a marathon tomorrow? Yeah, the, we have a really strong team. Uh, we're going to take part uh, tomorrow, uh, 24, kilo, 24 kilometers, and our biggest rival will be the Thaisians. All right, now over to you, um, Ura. This is your first Pacific Games. You guys won silver in the V12. What was going through your head? What were you feeling? How was the feeling winning silver as a first time in the Pacific Games with the rest of the team? Um, it was uh, very, I was really proud when we won a silver because it's my first time to be in Pacific Games. And uh, I was really proud and I think those who have uh, molded us and shaped us to to be on next stage. All right, thank you to you both for coming up, uh, joining me on the news. Now, if I can have a one team, one dream, go team PNG from you both. Look straight at the camera. One, one team, team, one dream. <laughs> it should have been one team, one dream, go team PNG. But anyway, thank you very much for joining me. Back to you, Helen. Thank you, Dini Rose. Stay tuned for more sporting action coming up after this break. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. The PNG Palais began their quest for a gold medal playoff as the women's sevens competition kicked off today. The Palais played three matches, winning two and losing one. New Guinea. New Guinea. The PNG Palais were determined to stamp their mark as a force in women's rugby sevens. They've been preparing since the beginning of the year while also attending the HSBC sevens competition. Many players in the team were part of the Oceania seven squad that qualified for the HSBC seven series. They played their first match today against Nauru, a country where only a few play sevens. Palais comfortably beat Nauru 47 points to zero in that match. The second match was against Solomon Islands. It was another easy victory for PNG as they ran over SI 53 points to zero. And prevent Gemma Schnellbelt from getting an easy try after the Solomon Islands put the ball. But they would be put to the test in their third match against the Fijians. The first half was dominated by the Fijians. Lazy defense and missed tackles saw Fiji score three easy tries before the break. Floats the ball on the inside and then t is brought to the ground on the 22. They still have numbers, Fiji, and they're not able to aim up. But a great show of a... In the second half, the Fijians were just too fast for PNG as they opened the scoring in the half, extending their lead. And then Sukhoi Wasa opens them up. And it's going to be too good, too strong for the defense who held on. PNG, on the other hand, were eager to pull some threat as they shifted the ball from right to left, finding Fatima Rama, who bolted down the touchline before being met by two Fiji players. Keeping the ball alive, Rama shifted the ball back to the right, and with good support play, they were able to score their only try. 30 meters out, this has been very good for Papua New Guinea. It's been a long time coming and they finally get their first try. Again, Penji's missed tackles and lazy defense had Fiji scoring two more tries to see out the match with a 38-5 win over the Palais. For them to put on the competitions as Fiji, they get into the backfield again. She's going to get it. No, she well, just pulled away. Elijah Levette, National MTV Sports. 
And now we go back to Samoa, where Dineros Raiko is on standby with Team PNG's general manager, Ansel Amiro. Hello again. Joining me this time is our beautiful GM for Team PNG, Enzila Miro, and she will be giving an update of some of our successes today, as well as what's coming up tomorrow. Enzila, thank you very much for joining me again. You look oh, lovely tonight. Pleasure. You look really <laughs> lovely tonight you. with your beautiful flower. It's Samoa, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. So tell me, there were a number of medals that we bagged today. Tennis was the biggest performance for the day, gold medal. Tell me, what else did we get today? Thank you and hello PNG from the um, Team PNG here in the PS Samoa. It's good to be giving another update today. So today we had tennis. Our women beat Samoa, the host country, begging a goal today. So that was a big one for PNG. Um, our men is currently speaking, are playing as I am speaking to you right now and they're playing for gold. So fingers crossed the next update that we give you will be a gold win for, for our tennis um, men. Um, in weightlifting today we had five silver and one bronze and that was the uh, medal for today. That's awesome. Now there was also a couple of um, successful events in um, sports like cricket. They came out with a couple of wins and they're going into gold medal playoffs tomorrow. Tell us about what's coming up tomorrow. What other um, sports, sporting codes from Team PNG are going into medal playoffs? So for tomorrow we have our table tennis playing for gold. That's both in men's double and our para-athlete. Uh, we also have coming up tomorrow, still in uh, table tennis, is our women's double and our mix. Um, team. They're playing for bronze tomorrow. Um, also coming up tomorrow we have cricket, men and women, both team playing for gold tomorrow. Uh, and also we have our weight in weightlifting. We have Stephen Curry lifting tomorrow in the 96 kilogram category. So we're really vying for him to beg our gold for tomorrow. And we have the final day for golf tomorrow as well. And our men's team is in contention for medal. So that's our updates for tomorrow. There you have it. A lot of things to look forward to for um, the big day that's tomorrow. Stephen Curry is lifting. Anyway, all the best to you and the team tomorrow. Thank you so much. Back to you, Helen. Thank you, Dini Rose Raiko, coming to us live there from Apia Samoa. Moving on, weather report is next. Stay tuned for the details. Kai Sport. True Kai Sport. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. Look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Fine weather in Port Moresby. Fine, although cloudy in Daru. Mostly fine weather in Kerma. Cloudy with some showers in Alotau and Popandita. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's the new sport and weather for tonight, Friday the 12th of July 2019. On behalf of the news team, pleasant viewing, good night. <laughs>